When talking to someone, I try to listen attentively and analyze all the information they provide. My ability to pay attention to details helped me uncover my wife's infidelity. It was a dialogue between my wife and daughter that shattered my world completely. Imagine a typical family. I, Trevor Fruden, am a 45-year-old man with a receding hairline, in decent shape but lacking six-pack abs, and could afford to lose about 10 pounds. I don't like facial hair and prefer contacts to glasses, still not needing reading glasses. Michelle, also 45, has a slight belly and a nicely rounded backside, a look I appreciate. She's an ordinary woman, neither strikingly beautiful nor unattractive, wearing glasses and disliking any attempts to shorten her name. Completing the family is our 21-year-old daughter, Ali, a bright college senior. Like her mother, she's gained some weight since her high school volleyball days. She's fiercely independent and vocal about women's rights, though heavily relying on her parents. I'm the sole breadwinner, and finances have been tight, with my primary concern being Ali's student debt. Michelle appeared adrift after Ali began college, her time previously filled by activities with her. Even increasing her volunteer work didn't seem to fill the void. One evening, I brought up the topic. Michelle, are you content? Content with what? Your life? You've distanced yourself from me and seem to have lost your enthusiasm. I miss the time I spent with Allie. I suppose I'm feeling bored. What about us? Is there something I'm neglecting? We're fine. I don't have any grievances. Why all the questions? I just want to see you happy. Perhaps you could consider seeing a counselor to help you regain balance, you know, to offer suggestions for lifting your spirits. I'm not sure. I'll think about it. Now that there's a slight cooling in the air, I decided to leave the topic. However, two weeks later, Michelle began weekly classes with a life coach. Perhaps like me, you thought that the dynamics in our bedroom would increase. But no. We stick to our usual bed life twice a week, which has been the norm for us for a long time. I'm not complaining. I've never discussed my bed life with anyone, nor do I pry into my friends' affairs. Mark and Cindy, both in their 60s, live south of us. Mark tends to keep his distance, while Cindy enjoys baking. I was at their place fixing their sauna pump when I heard Allie's voice. He's somewhere inside. His car is still here. I haven't seen him in a while, so I'm in the backyard sitting in the gazebo. As I heard that noise, I knew it couldn't be anyone but Allie, unless Michelle had returned from her mother's house. This was confirmed when I heard Allie speaking. Oh my God, Mom, you're so out of touch. Give Max a chance for once. Sally insists he's a pro at this, willing to go the extra mile to please you. Maybe that's exactly what you need to spice things up in our bedroom. What on earth? Did Michelle tell our daughter that everything's awful in our bedroom? Are we in trouble? Michelle hasn't said a word to me about any of this. Where did this come from? Are you still sure about our daughter? This is all wrong. I understand you need to consider it. Listen, Dad mentioned he's going hunting next weekend. I'll ask Jeff to invite Max over. He might be skinny, but he's into you. There was a moment of silence, during which my rising anger obscured my thoughts. Allow me to clarify the situation. Is my daughter attempting to set Michelle up with one of Jep's friends? I believe it would offer you a remarkable opportunity and you can even explore. The subsequent silence might have been due to my snapping. Are these individuals, along with their offspring, scheming to sabotage my marriage? What have I done to deserve this? All right then, keep me informed. I love you too. Goodbye. I was so furious that I was perhaps fortunate not to accidentally injure myself while working with that troublesome pump. The atmosphere at home was dismal all week. I made deliberate efforts to provoke Michelle and Allie, succeeding in keeping myself occupied mostly in my office or out in the garage. My power tools are now sharpened and gleaming. I didn't delay my hunting trip, but I had someone keep an eye on Michelle's movements. Seeing pictures of Ali, Jeff, and a skinny kid entering the house around noon on Saturday wasn't reassuring. Ali and Jeff departed around two, while the skinny kid left at four. Upon my late return on Sunday, Michelle, clad in sweats, attempted to be affectionate and cheerful, but I remained unaffected.
Although inconclusive, I observed Michelle sitting with her legs crossed, leaning heavily to the left, more than usual. Is someone's behind a little tender? Later in the kitchen, Allie sealed everyone's fate by playfully slapping Michelle's rear, leading to giggles from both. With a fake cough, I remarked, I feel a heaviness in my chest. I hope those oblivious fools I was hunting with didn't expose me to something. I'll sleep on the couch in the living room. Michelle fell for it. The next morning, I announced my plan to visit the doctor, feigning difficulty breathing. My boss didn't mind me taking the day off. I planned to feign having COVID, giving me the opportunity to hasten my departure. With a crude sick leave and vacation time, I could afford the break, ensuring I'd make it to our traditional Christmas Eve dinner. Announcing a COVID diagnosis tends to scare people off. Did I actually have it? Who knows? I'm fully vaccinated and feel perfectly healthy. Despite a shattered heart and a desire for vengeance, physically I'm fine. I checked into a comfortable extended stay hotel, seeing no reason to live frugally. Michelle appeared relieved when I mentioned I'd be out of quarantine in time for Christmas Eve. She'd been calling regularly along with her children. Instead of revealing my true intentions, I maintained politeness but pretended to be sleepy to end the calls. I spent my time devising gruesome revenge scenarios and compiling a list of changes for my finances. This included wills, beneficiaries, and emergency contacts. I hadn't realized how many ties I had with these arrangements. Searching for a new apartment was challenging and emphasized the finality of my decision to divorce Michelle and cut off financial support for Ali. I felt Jeff deserved some sort of retribution, but I was uncertain how to exact it, just as I was unsure how to confront Max about his actions. When consumed by anger, various thoughts crossed my mind, many of which could lead to legal repercussions and jeopardize my future plans. The notion of hiring an escort to ensnare Jeff stemmed from a news story. I saw about a company using similar tactics to remove unwanted employees. However, I recognized that this plan would also harm Allie, albeit deservedly so. The artificial trees sparkled with twinkling red, white, and green lights, while fragrant pine cones added to the festive ambience. We gathered around the dining table, ready to carry out our Christmas Eve tradition, a ritual we had faithfully observed for the past 23 years. The first two years lacked Allie's presence. Michelle had been busy in the kitchen, and now the meal was served before us. Typically, this would be the moment for a brief prayer of gratitude. But not tonight. As I rose to speak, it wasn't going to be the usual cheerful toast. So, ah, uh, Jeff, what did you think of Heather? Jeff's complexion paled as soon as I posed the question. Allie directed her inquisitive gaze toward him. She and Jeff had been a couple since high school. Was there anyone who doubted they'd still be together 50 years from now? Oxo asked me too. Things were on the verge of changing. Jeff stumbled over his words. Heather, I'm not sure I know anyone by that name. Oh, come on, Jeff, you remember her. The dark-haired beauty with ruby lips you were with last Sunday night, I said, giving him a thumbs up. At this point, Jeff would have leaped from a speeding train. He resorted to a politician's playbook. Deny, deny, deny. I don't recognize that name, he said, lacking conviction. Well, then let me play this for you. I played an audio clip on my mobile phone where he is having fun with this girl. Any lingering doubts about it being Jeff's voice vanished along with the fading audio waves. Ali erupted into a rage. You deceitful scoundrel. How could you do this? Leave. Right now. Get out. Before Jeff could rise, I positioned myself behind him, pressing down on his shoulders, anchoring him to his seat. Together, Jeff and I thwarted Allie's attempt to claw at his eyes. Allie, you're behaving like a wild animal. Michelle, could you please take your daughter to another room and try to calm her down? Junior, and I need to have a conversation. Michelle ushered Allie out of the dining room and into the kitchen though it wasn't a quiet exit, as Allie's stream of profanity continued to reverberate off the walls and over the steaming serving dishes. It took only a few minutes to outline to Jeff how things were going to unfold. He was to warn Max to never let our paths cross again, or Max would deeply regret his existence as a man.
Jeff was informed that his compliance was utterly unacceptable, and I made it clear I never wanted to lay eyes on him again. His pale face indicated he grasped his position and his limited options, from my possession to his. A Manila envelope exchanged hands. Jeff reluctantly agreed to carry out one final task for me. I called out to a shell from the kitchen urging her to return with Allie. We're ready to have a conversation. Allie's glare could have been deadly. Michelle looked confused, tears still evident on both their faces. Firstly, let me clarify how I obtained that recording. Jeff, her name isn't Heather. I don't know her real name. She's an escort. Quite an expensive one, I might add. I hired her to seduce you and record the encounter. There's also video footage if anyone wants to see it. Allie screamed. Daddy, what the hell? You hired her. I did, sweetheart. How does it feel to be betrayed like that? Michelle let out a small sound. Allie's eyes flicked towards, then away from her mother. Tears were streaming down both women's faces. Jeff, do you have anything to say? I switched on the video mode of my cell phone camera. Jeff stood up, grabbed the folder in front of him, and then turned to address Michelle. Michelle Fruden, you've been served, he said, handing her the folder. I wasn't certain whether Michelle would vomit or faint. Fainting won out. Vomiting followed shortly after she regained consciousness. The pine cones were no match. After Jeff served Michelle with the divorce papers, Allie did her best to comfort her mother as he quickly left the house. Allie quietly wept as she grappled with the enormity of the situation. While Allie and Michelle sought solace in each other's company in the master bedroom, I managed the logistics outside. Allie's Audi, a gift for graduating early in four years, was loaded onto the carrier and disappeared. Everything from her prized vehicle was stuffed into a garbage bag on the front porch. Check. Soon after Michelle's BMD was gone, her belongings were transferred to a 23-year-old sedan, symbolizing the length of our marriage. According to my attorney, I was still responsible for providing Michelle with transportation. Check. After clearing and canceling all our credit cards, including Allie's for which I was a co-signer, I poured myself another shot of bourbon. Cell phone contracts were terminated too, but I had to ensure Michelle had a phone, albeit a basic one with limited talk and text. Check. Allie wasn't granted the same privilege. They both kept their fancy iPhones with myriad features. They could manage their own plans and expenses. A for sale, coming soon sign now adorned the garage, swiftly hammered into the front yard to convey our impending change. However, selling the house was not feasible yet, as Michelle's name was on the title. It was more about signaling to her the direction our future was taking. Instead of staying in the living room listening to Christmas music by the tree, I opted to retreat to the basement. There's something calming about sitting in the dark especially when you can hear the chows unfolding above as they realize that none of their possessions are functioning. I was subjected to some rather unchristian epithets. Yet those insults were mild compared to the ones I had been shouting in my empty hotel room, anticipating this moment. Trevor, we need to talk. Maybe he went out for a walk. His car is still here. Mine's missing. Maybe he took it. My phone isn't working. My car's disappeared too. Perhaps Dad took it. He can't be driving both. Whose ugly car is parked in front of the house? My phone's dead too. That jerk better not have canceled my phone. Let's go ask Cindy if we can use her phone. Calm eventually settled over the house. A tactical mistake on their part. I secured the entry locks. Now they were outside without functioning phones or credit cards. And with both of their purses still inside, they had no identification on them. I felt no remorse as I fed both their driver's licenses into our paper shredder. Petty, yes, but I'm certain it will cause more than a little inconvenience as they attempt to rebuild their lives. Refilling my shot glass, I turned on the television and briefly tuned into a saccharine feel-good special. Our reality couldn't have been more distant from the sentimental scenes playing out on screen. Opting for silence seemed preferable. The tranquility was disrupted by commotion at the front door upon Michelle and Allie's return. Michelle's daughter, whom I no longer consider my own, caught sight of what was in the trash sack by the porch. Allie exclaimed, Oh my gosh, this is all the stuff from my car. Dad got rid of my car. Michelle was skeptical. 
He wouldn't do that. That's not like him. Well, maybe your car is missing because he sold it too. I swear if he did, I'll be furious. I adore that car. With the incessant doorbell ringing, it was difficult to catch all of their rapid-fire conversation. With two women at the door, both with elaborately painted nails, it would have been foolish to open it. Michelle was in rage. Trevor, open this door now. It's freezing out here. I shouted in response, Hey, Michy, your brand new car keys are in the ignition. That orange and green Malibu parked in front of the house is all yours. Everything from your old car has been transferred over. They say the heater takes a bit to warm up, and it's got a full tank of gas. Maybe you could hit up Max and crash at his place. I bet he still fancies you. One exclaimed, Oh shit, while the other muttered, He's on to us. Trevor, please let me explain, Michelle pleaded, her attempt at salvaging the conversation falling flat. After a brief pause, Michelle attempted a softer tone. Trevor, I know you're listening. Please say something. Merry freaking Christmas, you treacherous wenches. Get out of here, Mitchie, and take that damn daughter with you. A few minutes later, the old Malibu rumbled to life, sounding like it needed a new muffler. Not surprising, considering the guy practically handed me the car to get rid of it. I'm not going to spend a dime fixing it. Without any ceremony, the betrayers drove away from the house. It had been ages since I heard of anyone dying from carbon monoxide poisoning due to a faulty muffler. Maybe I'd be lucky. Probably not. Approximately an hour later, I noticed my father-in-law's phone number flashing on my cell phone screen. While we've never been close, we maintain a cordial relationship. After briefly contemplating whether to answer, I allowed it to divert to voicemail. Hey Trevor, I've got a couple of distressed women here. Thought you might have some insight into the situation. Give me a call. Oh, and Merry Christmas. I silenced my phone and eased my heightened adrenaline with a sip of spiked eggnog. The twinkling lights of the artificial tree gradually lulled me into slumber. The cold, bitter Christmas morning greeted me with sunshine. Despite the untouched serving dishes on the dining table, the microwave efficiently warmed up my breakfast. Ham with cheesy potatoes seemed fitting for any time of day. Gifts awaited unwrapping, yet Santa had left me nothing. The presents under the tree were meant for post-dinner opening, but it appeared nobody had noticed the absence of any gifts from me. I refrained from opening theirs as well, instead selecting my most cherished possessions to take with me. Not a single photograph of either woman made the cut. Any I found were left scattered on the floor. Michelle took a few days to locate me at my hotel. The sun had set and a chilly breeze swept through. I kept the latch on when I opened the door, half expecting another sales pitch for poinsettias or some fundraiser. Instead, it was Michelle looking pale without her usual makeup or styled hair. Trevor, please don't shut the door. I didn't, but I asked. What do you want, Mishy? A chance to explain. Can I come in? No. Please, Trevor, there's no need for your neighbors to hear this. What part of no don't you get? I can explain it to you just fine out here. All right, first, let me apologize. I can't really explain my actions. What actions, Mishy? Please, Trevor, let's not discuss this out here. Let me come in and explain. What actions, Dan it, Michelle murmured quietly. Being intimate with Max. You were intimate with Max? Well, isn't that something? Her eyes widened in surprise. You didn't know. I had my suspicions, but now they're validated. Every action has consequences. Wait. You were considering divorcing me without concrete evidence? Got it right, didn't I? Have you secured legal representation? I'm in the process, but I don't want a divorce. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to salvage our marriage. A bit late for that, don't you think? Why didn't you decide to do anything to save our marriage a month ago? I know why. It's because you're selfish and think you're beyond reproach. You believe you could act without consequences. Did you confess immediately? A day later? A week later? Damn. Michelle flinched at the hostility in my tone. That was a singular mistake. You must believe me. One lapse in judgment shouldn't unravel our marriage. Which mistake? There are plenty to choose from. Considering infidelity might grant you a reprieve. 
but actually cheating? That's a deal breaker. Concealing your affair ensured no chance of reconciliation, and involving your daughter was the ultimate betrayal. Yes, your daughter, whom I want no association with anymore. This is entirely your fault. If you had kept quiet about our private affairs, she wouldn't have been dragged into this. God, I loathe you. Some neighbors found entertainment in observing this tumultuous scene. Traver, I apologize. What can I do to mend things between us? You can't. I'm opting for the dump the cheater strategy. I'm hopeful I'll be better off without you. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, but it's on my terms. File for divorce and move on from your infidelity, understand? Please, Trevor, I understand you're hurting and angry, but please give it a couple of weeks. It was just one moment. How can I persuade you? Just leave and never bother me again. Now if you'll excuse me, halftime is over and the bowl game is resuming. Thanks for visiting. Not. The door closed softly. Michelle pleaded and knocked, but my noise-canceling headphones did their job. I'm not sure how long it lasted, but she wasn't there in the morning. A year minus a day later, I found myself sitting in my small one-bedroom apartment, carrying on the Christmas Eve tradition, alone, by choice. I prepared a simple meal for myself, something I had gradually become more adept at cooking. The common saying goes that you get stabbed in the back, but in reality, it felt like my heart, ego, and confidence were shattered. However, my self-respect remained intact. Many nights I pondered whether I had overreacted, but I never once believed I had. I was treated as expendable, so I made the decision to leave. End of story. My time in the midst of divorce proceedings felt like that of a defeated man. I became irritable to be around, earning rebukes from my boss for snapping at co-workers. Eventually, I withdrew into a life of solitude. My colleagues learned to give me space as I focused on my work diligently. Yet, I became absent from company gatherings. Despite attempts by friends to set me up, I rejected their efforts, causing them to gradually stop reaching out. My self-pity seemed endless, stretching on into the foreseeable future. I picked up running. When you have your earbuds in, people tend to leave you alone. With cooking for myself and my newfound hobby, I found myself needing to put on a few pounds. None of my old clothes fit anymore, so I had to adopt a more contemporary style. Occasionally a colleague would compliment me, but that was usually the extent of it. The divorce dragged on for nine months. Once we reached a certain point, the house sold quickly. Instead of monthly support, Michelle received the larger share of the proceeds. Allie and Jeff went their separate ways. It seemed acceptable for Michelle to cheat, but not for Jeff. Jeff, after a few too many drinks, confronted me last spring and blamed me for setting him up with Heather. He always finds someone else to blame. I wasn't there with Heather. He was, and he was weak, like most men his age. A seductive woman can easily entice. As for Allie, she attempted fruitlessly to express her anger towards me. She left a hostile message on my voicemail. Perhaps someday I'll return her call, but I wouldn't count on it. I wasn't invited to her graduation, nor did I attend. Michelle's situation was particularly difficult. She hadn't held a full-time job since we got married. My lawyer prolonged the financial proceedings as much as possible. When the house finally sold, I reimbursed all the money the court deemed she should have received in maintenance. Her comfortable lifestyle vanished as did mine. During a few attorney meetings, Michaela tried to persuade me that she had made grave mistakes, but that shouldn't lead to ending our nearly 25 years together. I stared back at her blankly, which led to a few tears. Hate is a potent emotion, and I struggled to contain mine. A year later, in my apartment, we continued our Christmas Eve tradition. Macy, a friend experiencing similar struggles to mine, sat with me. No, we're not romantically involved. I'm not ready for that yet. After we finished cleaning up, Macy took me to the center of the living room where we danced, occasionally holding each other closely. I missed the comfort of having a willing woman by my side. However, after about ten songs, Macy wiped away a tear and left. Both of us were damaged. Allie's tone in her monthly voice messages changed to one of apology. I chose not to return any of her calls. My nosy mother accidentally revealed that Michelle had moved in with someone.
Surprisingly, my reaction was mostly indifference. I'd started engaging in small talk with people again. Former colleagues avoid me, while new ones find me peculiar. Making friends is challenging for me, but I managed to connect with Macy. We're simply friends. Towards the end of January, I received a letter from Ali. I debated whether to open it or not, but curiosity got the better of me. Inside was a brief note and a selfie. Father, I deeply regret my actions that have caused you pain. As depicted in the image, I am expecting a child. I was hoping that you might consider welcoming a grandchild into your life. However, if you're unable to do so, I completely understand. With love, Ali. The sender's address was located a few counties away, indicating that she had moved. There was no mention of a husband, and if she was wearing any rings, they were difficult to see in the picture. I felt conflicted. I harbored resentment for what she had done to my life, yet I longed for grandchildren. It wasn't fair to blame the children for their mother's actions. I decided to take a few weeks before responding. Meanwhile, Macy and I went our separate ways. We both understood that we were just supporting each other temporarily. She chose to move far away and start afresh. With a few lingering hugs, she exited my life. To maintain my sanity, I started playing pickleball at the recreation center. It's similar to tennis, but with different rules. Eventually, you find yourself playing with people of similar skill levels, forming cliques reminiscent of junior high school. Shannon burst into my life unexpectedly. She appears to be around my age like many of the other players. When you're not very skilled, your shots often stray from their intended targets. One of my shots accidentally hit Shannon between her breasts. Her friends jokingly suggested that I should kiss it to make it better. I sent several kisses her way, causing her already flushed face to deepen a shade or two. As we were leaving after the games, Shannon teased me. The least you could do is buy me a soft drink. You seem very quiet and shy. My name's Shannon. What's yours? Trevor, I'm sorry for hitting you. It wasn't intentional. I'm not a great player, and I'm even worse at talking, especially with women. There's a Jamba Juice in that strip mall. I'll get you one, Trevor. I'll pay, Shannon. Shall we walk? Sure, why not? We got to know each other. Her responses were smooth, while mine stumbled. As the conversation continued, Shannon cornered me. Trevor, I can tell you're very insecure around me. If you don't mind me asking, are you seeing someone? No, Shannon, I'm not. Honestly, I'm not sure if I'll ever see anyone again. Did she pass away or leave you? She cheated on me, and I couldn't accept it. It's been a few years, and I guess I'm still not over it. How about you? Seeing anyone? Nothing serious. I go on dates, but that's it. When was your last date? Well, I haven't been on a proper date since we split up. I've had people over for dinner, but that's about it. When did your marriage end? That was December 26 months ago. Pretty pathetic, huh? Not really. It took me a couple of years to regain my confidence after being left for a trophy wife. The conversation was making me anxious, evident by the sweat on my palms. Shannon noticed. Let's change the subject. What got you into playing pickleball? I was tired of feeling sorry for myself, so I decided to try something new. That's how I got started too. My friends kept pushing me until I gave in. I really enjoy it. How about you? Yeah. Picking up a paddle and playing has helped me come out of my shell. Well, I have to go. See you tomorrow. I'm playing at 4 p.m. Sure. It was nice talking to you, Shannon. You too, Trevor. Hang in there. Things will get better. That evening, I felt confident enough to respond to Allie. Allie, I'm willing to give it a try. You and I may never be close, but I'd like to meet my grandchild at least. Please let me know when the time is right. Under no circumstances will I be in the same room as your mother. As I saw in Allie's selfie, I estimated a May or June due date. I'm unsure if Allie received my response, as I haven't received another letter from her. The following day at Pickleball, Shannon and a few other ladies were being flirtatious, which was quite enjoyable. After executing a particularly impressive shot, Shannon jokingly remarked, You know, Trevor, that shirt really suits you. I bet you'd look even better without it. The women chuckled as I felt my cheeks flush.
Intriguing observation, Shannon. I was just thinking how great you look in those yoga pants. I reckon you'd look even better without them. This sparked hysterical laughter, and Shannon blushed deeply. Soon the other ladies began chanting, Take them off, take them off, take them off. I complied and removed my shirt. Shannon vigorously shook her head, signaling, no, and wagged her finger at me as if scolding. Some of the ladies wolf whistled as I put my shirt back on. Shannon mouthed, you're terrible at me, to which I blew her a kiss. After the games, several of the women engaged in flirtatious banter, with one playfully commenting on how great she looked outside of her yoga pants. Shannon patiently waited her turn. Care to buy a girl a soft drink? I was just about to offer you one. Those yoga pants look good on you. Stop it. Feeling pretty confident, aren't you? She replied with a wide grin. As we enjoyed our drinks, I mustered up the courage to invite Shan out for dinner and a movie. I would have been devastated if she had rejected me. Fortunately, she didn't. After more than 27 years of not dating, I felt completely lost, awkward, and scared. However, I eventually managed to relax, and my former cheerfulness returned. After a few dates, Shannon persuaded me to stay the night. I think it was high time for both of us to start a bed life. Her question caught me off guard. Who were you thinking about when we were close? I paused to think. About you. I was wondering why a man like you might be interested in a man like me. A reflection of myself. And what do you find in me? We kissed passionately. By agreeing to get tested for STDs, we dedicated ourselves to each other. When the results turned out to be negative, we started an active bed life. Shannon made sure to include me when she had her family and grandchildren over, though it felt awkward initially. Her children are quite protective of her, but Shannon would subtly reassure me whenever tensions arose by squeezing my hand or giving me a peck on the cheek. Eventually, I was accepted. In early June, Shannon snuggled up to me in bed. Let's see if you know how to celebrate Grandpa, she said. Do you know something I don't? I asked. Well, there's only one major hospital where Allie lives, so I've been checking the registry for newborns. A mother named Allie Fruin gave birth to a girl two days ago. What should I do now? Send flowers. They don't have to be overly romantic, just acknowledge her new role as a mother. The next day after sending the flowers, an overnight letter was received. Dad, I understand that my apology may sound insincere, but I truly mean it. After the awful meltdown we had on Christmas Eve, I harbored a lot of hatred towards you. I blamed you for the breakdown of my relationship with Jeff and for taking away my car, my phone, and essentially my independence. For a long time, I was bitter and immature. But eventually, I began to see things from your perspective. You didn't deserve the way we treated you, and I'll never forgive myself for that. I realize now that I was a terrible person but I've grown and gained a better understanding of the lessons you tried to impart on me. I've changed a lot. How could I have been so cruel to someone who guided me from childhood to adulthood? It was truly despicable, and I shed many tears over it. I was selfish and thoughtless. It's not easy to admit, but I'm trying to make amends. I want you back in my life. I yearn for your comforting embrace just one more time. I need you to see the sincerity in my eyes as I apologize. I want us to be friends, friends who guide each other towards what's right and strong. I know I have a lot to learn, but I'm willing to try. What can I offer you in return? The only thing that comes to mind is a grandchild. You have a granddaughter named Bonnie, named after your mother. I'm back home now, living in a small apartment. I'm not married, so it's just Bonnie and me against the world. You're welcome to visit us anytime. Or if you prefer, I can bring Bonnie to you with everything she needs. I'll always be your daughter, and I long for your love once more. With love, Allie. I showed Shannon the letter. She appears genuine. What's your plan? Keep you away from her. She's already destroyed one of my relationships, and I value what we share. That earned me a warm hug and a tender kiss. Thank you, Trevor. Don't fret. I can handle myself, and I've built walls to keep out intruders. I'm not sure how you managed to breach those defenses, but I'm glad you did. We embraced for a while, swaying as if to a slow love song. 
You know, Trevor, you can't fully love me while still holding on to hate. Let go of the past so our relationship can flourish. Shannon was right. It was time to move on. The lights were on in the apartment listed as Allie's return address. With Shannon peering over my shoulder, I softly knocked on Allie's door. Her eyes widened as she exclaimed, Daddy, what a surprise. Come in. Allie, meet Shannon. Shannon, this is my daughter, Allie. With gentle cheek hugs, we stepped into her apartment. Would you like to hold Bonnie? I settled at the kitchen table and cradled Bonnie delicately. She didn't cry. I had forgotten how tiny their hands and feet could be. Shannon looked at me affectionately. Shannon broached the subject. So, Allie, you've mentioned you're not married. No, Bonnie's father thinks I'm trying to trap him. We were drunk, and he didn't use protection. He knew I wasn't on the pill. Maybe he'll come around. Then again, maybe not. Allie and I navigated around each other all evening. I departed without giving her a hug or a kiss. As I turned on the car engine, Shannon admonished me. She needs to know you still care about her. I know you do. You know you do. Go back up there and do the right thing. Leaving Shannon in the car, I approached Allie's door. Did you forget something? Sort of. I forgot to give you a hug and let you know that I still love you. Hallmark should consider making a movie about how emotional things got after that. Half a year and a few weeks afterward, in my apartment we gathered for the customary Christmas Eve dinner. Shan and Allie and I were there, with me holding Bonnie. I delivered the Christmas blessing before we indulged in dinner, and then proceeded to unwrap gifts. Bonnie received more than her fair share of presents, but she seemed particularly delighted by the crinkling sound of the wrapping paper as she played with it. Due to the hazardous conditions of snowy Christmas Eve roads, I offered Allie and Bonnie accommodation in my apartment. Shannon and I opted to spend the night at her house, a routine that had become increasingly common lately. Twelve months later, the annual Christmas Eve dinner took place at Shannon's residence. We executed a prenuptial agreement prior to our wedding. I'm under close scrutiny when it comes to the other women in our pickleball group showing interest in me, but it doesn't bother me. This year we're joined by Carter Denton, Allie's husband and father of Bonnie. It took him some time to realize that he truly wanted to be a part of Allie and Bonnie's lives. Bonnie and I are inseparable companions. I cherish being her papa. Shannon's children and grandchildren were also in attendance. One of her sons led the Christmas prayer. Life continues whether you're actively participating or not. It took me a while to recognize that life was slipping away from me. Not anymore. I'm content with where I've ended up. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.